name is Rowan Reimer. I'm a resident of Vancouver. I'm Andy Jones. I'm a grade 12 student at West Wells Secondary. I will be presenting first. Hello, my name is Rowan. I am 17, year old, 17 years old, and I'm a student at Vancouver Technical Secondary School. I'm a queer and gender variant individual, and I have a 1 in 12 chance of being murdered in my lifetime for these reasons. I am speaking in support of the revised LGBTQ plus, plus policy, which worked to provide a greater support for LGBTQ plus individuals. It will create a safer environment for LGBTQ plus students, staff, and families in Vancouver schools, and it will help to make our future a better place. I've had a lot of experience with the difficulties that LGBTQ plus individuals face in the school system and in our day-to-day -day lives. Not just limited to me, but to other people, we face things like, I can tell you about the verbal and the physical harassment and the abuse. I can tell you about being taunted and being yelled at and being spit on when you try to use the washrooms that correspond with your gender identity. I can tell you about binding, about my friends who bind their chest down with tape and ace bandages which can crack your ribs and give you permanent deformation because of unsupportive families. I can tell you about having fake boy or girlfriends to hide the fact that we're queer. I can find, tell you about the difficulty of simply finding a sport that allows trans players without any harassment. I can tell you about being told that we're abominations, about the hopelessness that descends upon you, about feeling completely worthless about people who change schools, leaving friends and athletics behind to escape some of the difficulties of transitioning or coming out. I can tell you about the slurs and the times when we start to hate ourselves and it just becomes so much that we start to take it out on ourselves. I can tell you about how I spent months using only the washroom in the basement of, the school of, of my school where no one ever goes, about how I would sneak into it, making sure that nobody would see me, just so I wouldn't get yelled at using the wrong washroom. I can tell you about how hard it is to do anything, let alone study and pass your classes when you're consumed with the hatred that people pour onto you. I can tell you about how kids try to take their own lives and how they cut into their own skin because of the hatred that surrounds them. I can also tell you about the kids who have supported. I can tell you about supportive and loving families who nurture their children and tell them that they are normal and everything is going to be okay. I can tell you about supportive schools and supportive teachers who make all the difference and set you up for such a better life. These kids don't have to worry about a lot of the things I previously mentioned. They have safe spaces. I am lucky enough to be one of these people for the most part. I have an incredibly supportive family. We even have a pronoun jar, and when my parents misgender me, you put 50 cents in the jar. <laughs> It's nice to know that this was not my idea, my parents actually suggested it. I also play junior roller derby in Vancouver, where we not only welcome gender variant individuals, but support them. We have trans players, and you do not ever get harassed. It's incredibly nice. I don't mean to tell you that people in supportive environments are happier, safer, and lead better lives. School is where we learn so many of our attitudes and start becoming responsible citizens. The passing of this policy will not instantly make the world a better place but it is a step in a process that will lead us there. This process is of teaching the youth of today and tomorrow though, to embrace those around them, to love them, support them, and push them forward. Thank you. and I'm a grade 12 student at Prince of Wales Secondary. I'm also their student council president. As a person who believes in equality and representing a community that has been too often marginalized by society, LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, two-spirit, queer, or questioning rights are a vital component in keeping with the society that strives for inclusiveness and equal access. Here at the Vancouver School Board, I believe everyone deserves an equal education, no matter what their gender, identity, or sexual orientation be. I would also like to dispel, to dispel any myths that are of concern, especially towards the proposed all-gender or gender-neutral washrooms article, under Article 7 of the proposed policy revisions that the Pride Advisory Committee has suggested. In no way are we trying to convert all bathrooms into all gender washrooms. 
These washrooms are to provide a third bathroom choice for anyone who does not feel comfortable or safe in gender binary washrooms, otherwise known as male and female washrooms. However, it should be clear that all gender washrooms are not only to accommodate predominantly gender non-conforming and trans students, but also to raise awareness that there are people who don't fit under the socially constructed gender norms. This policy in LGBTQ awareness intersects with civil rights movements seen in the past from, raci from racially segregated people, from people who could not visit the washrooms, people who are physically disabled, all gender washrooms are an awareness and a protection that correspond to all human rights. I would also like to mention that schools across the district, including my own, Prince of Wales Secondary, have already implemented all gender washrooms. Not to mention the Vancouver Parks and Recreation Board's recent passing of a bylaw passing all gender washrooms. I hope that we can all see today that LGBTQ rights for a perpetual fight towards equality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, the, are there any questions from the committee members? If not, thank you very much. Uh, may I just add that I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but I am okay being filmed. <laughs> I'd like to call on uh, Jane Bowie. Hi. I'm Jane Bowie, and I'm co chair of the Public Education Project a parent and a former Vancouver school board trustee. And with me I have... I'm Gwen Giesbrecht, also uh, co-chair of the Public Education Project, former DPAC chair, currently co-chair at Britannia Secondary PAC, and also a parent and a resident of uh, Vancouver. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, and I hope that we can all listen and learn from each other this evening. I want to give a little bit of context to today. Around 2001, Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, and questioning youth came to the Vancouver School Board. They talked about the harassment they experienced in the school system. Their stories were compelling, often harrowing, and always inspiring. And they had important data from the McCreary Center to back up their experiences. The board took action, implementing a plan to make schools safer and more welcoming for all students. But in particular, LGBTQ plus students. In 2003, the board that I, am now, that I was now a member of established the Pride Advisory Committee to give advice to the board on how best to implement that plan. The advisory committee was modeled after other advisory committees in the district. It was composed of representatives of our education partners, district parents, elementary and secondary administrators and teachers, and other employee groups. And just like committees such as the Special Education Advisory Committee, representatives <coughs> from organizations with an expertise in that field. In 2004, policy that had been developed by the Advisory Committee in consultation with senior staff in the district was passed. The policy was groundbreaking. Vancouver was only the third district in Canada to develop a comprehensive policy to address harassment and discrimination based on sexual orientation, and only the second to address discrimination based on gender identity. That was a decade ago. And in the intervening years, the advisory committee and trustees such as myself heard from parents and youth like we've already heard from tonight that that policy was not adequately addressing the experiences of students who are gender variant. Students who are often invisible. Some of these students have had great experiences. Many have not. It's hit and miss. It depends on the students and their parents' abilities to advocate for themselves. It depends on caring teachers and on administrators' understanding of what needs to be done. But when it misses, these students' lives are hell. Students are dropping out, parents are homeschooling, 
and research that's been done in Vancouver schools by Elizabeth Sawick, the McCreary Center, and Dr. Catherine Ten Taylor is backed by research from across the country. It documents the disproportionate levels of verbal abuse, physical and sexual violence experienced by gender non-conforming students, the higher levels of suicide attempts. The research also shows, though, that specific policy that addresses sexual orientation and gender expression and identity made real difference in these students' lives and make our schools safer for all students. <coughs> it was clear that Vancouver schools needed more detailed policy to address the, the situation. The Pride Advisory Committee researched policy in other districts. We studied material produced by the Public Health Agency of Canada, Vancouver Coastal Health, the BC Teachers Federation, and consulted experts in the field. The revisions to the policy were begun when I was still a trustee in 2010. Early drafts were reviewed by advisory committee members, including parents. Since that time, it's been revised, streamlined, updated, reviewed by senior management. And I, as a former trustee, am pleased to see what's been presented here and appreciate the chance to speak in favor of it. This policy, common sense and well-researched, will make Vancouver schools even more safe and welcoming and inclusive for all students to learn, to celebrate diversity, and most importantly, the policy will literally save lives. Thank you. registered like all the other 35 and for the sake of uh, the meetings organization I think it would be best to, for her to sign up for the next meeting there, what, what next speaker I'm not speaking are there any events you have to thank your trustee about all the time? I could, though. I she's, 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 she's here for more support. Once I get started, you know, as usual, Jane is used up all the time. <laughs> any questions the for Jane? The floor is open for uh, questions. Trustees? No? Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Sally Lynn and Kathy. of the school board. My name is Kathy and I am a BDSC representative. However, today I am speaking as a student um, and only as a student. Hi everyone, my name is Sally and I am the communications officer on the Vancouver District Students Council. Both me and Kathy are grade 11s from Sir Winston Churchill Secondary and repeating what Kathy just said, today we represent ourselves and our own opinions. So when we first read the new LGBTQ policy, we were amazed and pleased by how detailed and considerate it is with student needs. Um, however, it soon came to our attention that the policy received some rather negative responses. And we are here because we believe that the benefits of this policy far outweigh the potential drawbacks that are fueling the complaints. We believe that as representatives of the school student body, it is our job to ensure that students have their voices heard. However, the voice of the LGBTQ community have remained silent due to fear of discrimination. Implementing this new policy will not only better the LGBTQ individual's feelings of security, but also assert the importance of this issue and its resolution. <coughs> when it comes to well-being, the most important consideration is that of health, both physical and mental. People may ask, well, what's that got to do with LGBTQ? It's significantly connected to student he mental health because bullying is a problem that is still present. In fact, it may be worse now because students can not only get bullied at school, but also at home because of techn technological advances. And bullying is a high risk cause of mental health issues. What can be more important to have the money go into? And how can invest in other less important things be of any use if the students are coming to school depressed and completely unprepared to learn. 
or having some sort of other undiagnosed mental health symptom that is showing. As students, we feel that health comes before anything else because students should come prepared to learn, prepared to meet other bright-minded people and not worry about being discriminated against. This means that student health goes hand in hand with student safety. I came straight from a conference called What's Standing in the Way of Education, Change in Education, and one of the major concerns at my discussion table was mental health. Students face so much stress on a daily basis because of uh, parent expectations, school expectations, juggling their responsibilities, extracurriculars, etc. They've, they've reflected, these people at my discussion table, they've reflected that the number of students who have cut or who have suicidal or other dark thoughts, the number is just outrageous. And so why make LGBTQ an extra problem? Why prevent students from better learning? We need to stop making our peers further unaware of the world around, of, around us. We need to protect all of us. Vancouver has often been reputed for being one of the best cities to live in in the world. Now the beauty of our city should not be purely from the natural, our natural environment, but the level of respect and acceptance harbored towards diversity. No excuse is sufficient to re a reason against implementing this policy. To reiterate, every child deserves to feel comfortable and safe, especially at school where they are being educated and ready for transitioning out of adolescence. The years spent at school should be insightful, inspiring, and explorational, rather than traumatic. As I look around the room, I see many signs communicating the desire for protection of all children. So how does this policy go against that? The LGBT <laughs> the LGBTQ community has been attacked for far too long. How the pol um, the policy would not have been drafted had these individuals not been tormented and harassed by their peers to the point where suicide becomes an option. Can you call this adequate protection? This is the 21st century. People should openly embrace the LGBTQ crowd and not deny a policy that protects students. Not only that, students should even be taught of its importance through certain courses. This is about equity for students because equality may not apply in this case. These students require this need and protection, and this is why this policy is going to help them, because equity comes, equity in this place is more applicable. All of us are students, and we stand as what we would, as the norm would consider normal students, as straight students, but we care, because students are the same as us. All of us, every single one of us matter. We care about our peers and their well-being. This is not something extra. This is a basic need, a basic necessity to protecting the well-being and fulfilling the education model of BC, providing the best experience possible. And we hope to further clarify that because just because this policy is passed, it doesn't necessarily mean that the gender-neutral washrooms will be built right away, but it will rather happen over a period of time. I would also like to clarify that this is a policy that was already present for a long time, as the, the past speaker has stated, and this is merely a revision to accommodate for more students. Excuse me. Sorry, are you finished? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Straight Alliance clubs in all of our schools for some time. Can you talk a little bit about your experience of how that's worked in your school and the impact of it? Um, well, we do have a Rainbow Alliance club at our school, um, and I have friends who are in that club. Basically, it's um, that they they raise awareness about um, the LGBTQ and you know issues surrounding that. Um, yeah, and yeah, um, I personally have transferred 
to three different high schools in my experience. So at every high school, the having a Gay Straight Alliance Club or having a Rainbow Alliance Club has nothing but been positive to the student body because even if it's the little signs that they stick around about fun facts or making puns about it's educating us about the LGBTQ community, it's significant and it's important and it's, just, it's teaching students about equity and awareness about the world around us. Trustee Valentine. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was great. Thanks for your presentation. Um, one of my concerns here tonight is that we're talking about um, a revision to the, the guidelines of the uh, document, not really that we're doing away. So we already have the guidelines that are there. And um, I'm hoping that the speakers are going to talk a little bit about the insides of what those uh, changes are as opposed to, I mean, we, we have a very tolerant Vancouver School Board, it's very tolerant of, a, of the LB, LBTQ uh, uh, population, but um, I'm just wondering um, if, I'm hoping that the speakers are, are talking mainly to the points of the revisions as opposed to the, because we already have it in place and it's not going away anywhere, it's, it's there for the students and we really believe that it really, really does work for the students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Trustee Wong. Thank, thank you, Chairperson. Um, just a comment. When you introduced yourself earlier, you're, you're both VDSC reps, but you're not speaking on behalf of VDSC. But we had a, all the trustees receive a, a letter from the president of VDSC, it, basically in the same lines of what you stated today. So is there do you know about that, the letter, and are you, you're not here, but will someone be presenting on behalf of VDSC later, or we're just going with the letter they submitted to us? Um, what, what we meant was, <laughs> what we meant was um, our opinions, what we're expressing here, these, um, there, there is no, uh, I guess there, there's no bias or there's no pressure from um, the, the, the VDSC, but this, this is purely what we truly believe in, like our, we ourselves. Yeah, and it just shows that the VDSC, all of our hearts are in line, and we believe that this is a good policy. Thank you. Just before the next speaker comes up, uh, just want to remind uh, delegations that at the four minute mark, you will hear a beep, and that means one minute to wrap up. So just to be cognizant of that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barbara Finley. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about this very important issue. I want to acknowledge that we're on Coast Salish territory. I am a resident of Vancouver. I'm a lawyer, and I've been doing queer rights law for about 20 years. I am a founding member of SOGIC, which is the CEP Canadian Bar Association Sexual Orientation Gender Identity Conference, and I currently sit on the Trans Clinical Care Providers Group. I want to say three things. I want to say this policy is legally required. It's not a choice. The second thing I want to say is we all grew up, and I mean all of us, and I want to really acknowledge the people in the room who might disagree with me, because the one thing that we all share is a concern for the children who are enrolled in schools in Vancouver. We might have differences from time to time about how that goes, but the fact is we all have that at our hearts. We all grew up believing that when a baby was born, you could know what their gender was. One quick look, and it was fixed for life. We believed that there were two and only two genders. We believed that gender never changed. All of those beliefs are mistaken. Gender identity. Gender identity is the sense of who we are from a gender perspective. 
I might say to you, what's your gender? And then my next question is, how do you know? And the answer is so much bound up with who we think we are, we don't even know how to answer the question. For most of us, cisgender people, that means that our sense of who we are matches the genitalia, that the guess the doctor made when we were born was correct. For some of us, that's not so. Gender identity develops when we're about three or four. And here's the piece. For the purposes of the law, gender equals gender identity. The boards, the, the boards, and we need and, a diverse with my voice from the people. Order, please. Um, there, there will be other speakers who speak to the medical research about this, so I'm not going to address that. But I, I can say with authority that in Canadian law, trans children are protected from discrimination and we owe them a duty to accommodate. That is to say that we are required as a public body to provide um, in the same way that if we have students in wheelchairs, we have to have ramps. If we have transgender students who are so afraid to go to the washroom that they end up with bladder damage, we have to provide them with safe washrooms. And for trans children, home is not always a safe place. For queer children, home is not always a safe place. When I came out as a lesbian, my father told me that he was very glad I didn't live in the same city that he did. So the elements of the board's duty include the duty not to discriminate, the duty to provide the safety that trans students need, and the duty of confidentiality in the same to the same extent as you have that duty if a student discloses anything else that they don't want their parents to know for reasons of safety. I want to conclude by telling you about two clients of mine. One of them is six years old. One of them is 11. Neither of them, you'll be happy to know, goes to school in Vancouver. Uh, but the six-year-old went to school and said, I want my teacher to read the book, My Princess Boy, because that's who I am. I'm a boy who likes girly things. The horrible story, months later, is that the teacher outed the student, the transgender student, without, without any advance notice to the student or anyone else. That's my one minute or my last? Is that my? Your last. All right. So my 11-year-old student tried to kill himself. You've heard what the cost of not having this policy is. Thank you for your attention. I have one last thing I want to say to everyone here. We are all some of you, and you are all some of us, because some of your children are trans. Thank you.
recommendations are presenting so that trustees can make a decision. Uh, this has not been passed, just to clarify that. Our next uh, presenter is uh, Melody Priest. I'm a registered psychologist and I'm a clinical assistant professor at the Department of Family Practice, Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. In my private practice, I have worked with over 400 transgender adults and youths for the past 10 years. I have reviewed the draft policy changes and I believe they are absolutely necessary to ensure that transgender children in particular and transgender youth can participate fully in school activities and complete their education without fear. In my practice, I have seen too many young people who have opted out of school, gone for homeschooling, or dropped out of school entirely. Others stay home from school on every PE day and avoid eating and drinking at school because they can't access safe washrooms and change rooms. For those youth who have changed schools in order to live in their preferred gender, there's the constant fear of being outed by someone who is unaware of the safety implications. There are a number of misconceptions with regards to gender variance, many of them fostered by early research that used unrepresentative samples and offered biased interpretations of results. However, in the past 15 years, both the quality and the quantity of research in this area has improved substantially, and healthcare professionals have developed a much clearer understanding of the issues. For example, it is now generally agreed by researchers and clinicians that gender variance is not a mental illness, but a natural variation. <laughs> research that has shown prepubertal children with gender variants to have no more mental health concerns than prepubertal children with ADHD. Similarly, research on transgender adolescents has shown that almost 70% have no mental health concerns <coughs> whatsoever. These results are consistent with my experience and the experience of my colleagues. The fact of the matter is that the vast majority of transgender individuals have no symptoms of mental illness. Much has been made of the rates of suicidality in transgender individuals, and they are certainly concerning. However, recent research out of Ontario has demonstrated that for transgender children with supportive families, the risk of suicidality is no greater than the risk of suicidality for youth in general. Another study out of the States found that it is discrimination, victimization, violence, and being harassed and bullied at school and at work that are the strongest predictors of suicidality in transgender individuals. These results clearly indicate that the rate of suicidality in transgender people is a direct response to how they are treated in our society rather than a flaw in their psychological makeup. Another misconception is the notion that gender identity can be changed through therapy. This is absolutely not true. In fact, attempts to change the, trans the gender identity of transgender people have failed so consistently that several prominent professional organizations have publicly stated that any attempt to do so is highly unethical. Not only are such efforts unethical, but most agree that such efforts are actually psychologically damaging. So let's focus on what we can change. What we can change is the way our schools respond to gender-variant youth. Inclusive, accepting, and supportive responses are the best treatment available. And I have personally witnessed the miracles of such an approach. By passing these policy changes, you are offering the young people I'm currently working with a guarantee that they can confidently return to school in September, knowing that their school is a safe and welcoming place. You are giving them the reassurance that they will have access to the same opportunities as any other student. 
The difference that will make to their mental health and well-being cannot be overstated. Thank you. position of the Canadian Psychological Association and perhaps even the American or international law on the issue? The American Psychological Association and the American Psychiatric Association have both provided consensus statements on, on the unethical, uh, unethicalness of, of reparative therapy of any kind for gender and for sexual orientation. My understanding is the Canadian Psychological Association, which is a lot smaller, is still working on their uh, position paper. Trustee Paquez and then Trustee Valentine. Thank you very much, Dr. Priest. And I just um, I wanted to just ask, one of the concerns that I've been hearing is the issue of confidentiality reporting, what the professional guidelines are in terms of uh, uh, disclose, what, what youth disclose to, to staff in the school, what uh, what are the professional guidelines in terms of um, confidentiality versus uh, parental knowledge and, and where do we, um, how, how, what's your perspective on that? Well, as, as a psychologist, my, my duty is to report uh, something a child tells me only if it is going to put that child in severe danger or harm. Um, when it comes to something personal that is not uh, harming anyone else, I would, of course, encourage the child to share it with the parent. But I would, if, if it would put the child at risk to do so, then I would not insist on that. Thank you. Trustee Donaldson? Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, maybe just to follow up on Betty's question, um, do you think there is a, um, I think there is an age of consent. We have an age of consent for uh, getting married or developing relationships. Um, is there a sense of, from your perspective, because I mean you're the professional here, uh, I'd be interested in hearing if there's a, a sense of where um, parents could be included or parents maybe not included. And um, I'm thinking of all the other kinds of uh, consents that we have out there, 14 years old for this, 16 years old for that. And um, I think the concerns around parents where um, they, being the primary caregiver, it's kind of a hard one to call uh, from your perspective because you're making a judgment call. And I, I'm wondering if there's some guidelines there that from your perspective that would be helpful for parents and for the general community. Well, for me and my colleagues, when we see young people, usually they are brought to us by their parents. So that makes things really easy because the parent wants the best for the child. And we can talk together about how that can happen. And that is certainly the ideal situation. And I think more and more it is the typical situation. If, if a 15-year-old child comes to school and says, I'd like you to call me Ben, and say he instead of you know my feminine name, and I don't want you to tell my parents about it, I don't see how that would cause a tremendous amount of harm. You know, it kind of depends on, on is that like a perfect, it's like a nickname or something. Thank you. Okay. And thank you very much. <laughs> Maria Thompson. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak tonight. I have quite a bad cold, so I hope my voice, can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I'm Marian Townsend, I'm a family doctor, and I have the privilege of serving many uh, transgender youth and adults in my practices at Three Bridges Community Health Center and at the Catherine White Home and Wellness Center. I'm the physician lead for transgender primary care at Vancouver Coastal Health, and I'm here speaking today with the full support of my organization. Um, 
I am a member of the BC Trans Clinical Care Group, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and the Canadian Professional Association for Transgender Health. In addition to my clinical work with trans people, I teach extensively on the topic of transgender health care. I am a clinical instructor with the Faculty of Medicine at UBC, and I teach medical students as well as residents in family practice and specialty disciplines. I have been an invited speaker at many peer-reviewed conferences on the topic of transgender medicine. So I'm here tonight in my professional capacity to share my support from a professional perspective for this policy. But on a personal note, I would just like to take a moment um, to mention that I'm also the parent of two graduates of Vancouver Public Schools, one of whom is here with me today and also uh, very supportive of this policy. And I also am a queer woman and my partner is a trans person, so I have a personal uh, investment in this issue as well and I'd like to acknowledge that. As you will see tonight, and perhaps you're gathering it already, you would be hard pressed to find healthcare providers working in this field today who would oppose this policy. That being said, I understand that the uh, opposition may have managed to find a name or two of folks out there uh, who share their viewpoint. I would like to clarify for the board and repeat what Dr. Priest has already said, that people who advance ideas such as reparative therapy are in a very small and disappearing minority, and thankfully, and those harmful ideas have been discredited by the vast majority of experts in this field. I applaud the VSB for imp implementing policy that is based on our current understandings of gender diversity, which emphasize depathologization and self-determination of gender identity. I know you have received many admissions detailing the facts related to trans and gender diverse youth, indisputable evidence if you read it, which underscores the need for protective policies. So rather than repeating statistics, I would like to share with you some of my experience as a family doctor who has been serving these communities for the past seven years. I'd like to tell you that time and time again, I have sat with a new patient in their mid-20s or their mid-30s, sometimes even older, who has finally found their way to my office in search of life-saving, gender-affirming care. They share stories with me that have become painfully familiar and repetitive, stories of lost time, stories of adolescent and teen years spent hiding, ashamed, invisible, afraid, stories of not fitting in, of harassment, of physical violence. They tell me about years of isolation, depression, self-harm, coping with substance use, not making it to graduation. Time and time again, I have sat and listened to these heartbreaking stories. And these are the people who have made it. These are the people who have survived. Because as you, as you know, many do commit suicide. Lately, I've had patients presenting at younger and younger ages, and I'm thrilled to see them courageously seeking out care rather than suffering in silence. The messages that those youth receive from the adults in their world, their peers, their parents, their teachers, those can make all the difference. Those messages about gender identity, they can make all the difference in the youth's ability to feel okay about coming out to themselves and coming out to others. Support from the school community is especially important when that youth comes from a homophobic or transphobic family. Supported youth show emotional strength and resiliency. They're far less likely to be depressed or to use drugs or alcohol to cope. Supported youth are able to succeed in school academically and socially. I see them go on to graduate and go on to post-secondary education or to live out their dreams in other ways. 
the VSB policy touches on critical aspects of supporting trans children and youth, which are consistent with best practices and current medical evidence. Things like respect for confidentiality and privacy, use of preferred names and pronouns, clothing that aligns with gender identity, bathrooms, a change room accessibility, access to physical education and sport, also consistent with expert opinion this support and accommodation of self-identified trans students within public schools is individualized based on the student's needs and is not dependent on medical or psychiatric assessment, diagnosis, or treatment. These measures, this is my last point, I know I'm probably over. These measures will greatly improve the safety and well-being of trans and gender diverse youth and will no doubt benefit the entire school community. All of the youth will benefit. Because everybody, everybody is adversely affected by gender discrimination, by sexism, by gender stereotypes, and by assumptions about gender and sexual orientation. Please implement this policy and do it quickly. Thank you. the nature of the of the support how would you define that support from those organizations um, that is uh, was it legal is it in terms of medical is it support from them or from their boards to give you I'm, sort of I'm sorry I, I'm not quite sure I understand what you're asking the support for me who, to who be are you here? speaking on behalf of well really I'm speaking on behalf of myself as a physician who serves trans people, um, I mention the places that I work because I really think it's important that people know of my experience and my professional expertise in this area. My main job is with Vancouver Coastal Health and they have given me permission to speak here tonight and permission to submit a letter to you. And I believe they also sent you a letter uh, in response to some concerns that came to your attention. So. Um, Vancouver Coastal Health has a mandate to serve marginalized people. So this is a vulnerable, vulnerable group that we're talking about. And of course, Vancouver Coastal Health would, would be in support of policy that's going to protect that group. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't You're basically speaking on behalf of yourself. I can only ever speak on behalf of myself. I think that's all we can all do, really. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Uh, just a reminder uh, of the present presenters that if you could leave your uh, written presentations with uh, our staff. Thank you. Trustee Warner? Yeah, just a point of order through the chair. Um, usually the tables over there are reserved for stakeholders. There's a gentleman in a blue shirt over there recording at the stakeholder table, and i just like to ask that he could maybe step back uh, with the audience like everybody else, and he's not disrupting people moving back and forth there. I think that would help. Thank you. Our next uh, presenter, Cheryl Chang. Thank you. I'm here this evening to ask for two things. One, that this policy conversation be slowed down and that proper consultation take place with parents and medical and mental health professionals. And two, that any policy that is to be voted on by the board 
should not be considered until it has been approved by the College of the, the BC College of Physicians and the BC College of Psychologists. Respect, I would really request that people not applaud to anything I say or when I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This discussion here tonight is appalling. I am afraid that what is going on here is about politics and not about the health of our children. This discussion should be taking place behind closed doors with professionals who are on both sides of the debate. The research that I've done, and by the way, okay, I don't have a proper um, submission written up to hand in tonight, because I only found out about this policy one month ago, yesterday. One month, and I knew nothing about what was going on, and I am chair of the Lord Bing PAC. I asked my DPAC rep, did he know anything about it? He knew nothing about it. I am appalled that this paper was being passed around on such a tight timeline with no notice to parents, no notice to schools, and that we are setting up a war between people you might say on the left or the right. This is about the politics of division, and I am appalled. I think you need to stop what you're doing and slow this down and get the professionals involved to make a decision about a health and mental health policy that affects children and their lives. Yes. No, yes. No, yes. no, sorry, please don't. Thank you. Since I sent around my open letter to tell people what was going on, I have been inundated with parents and people who are concerned. Once they see it, they're concerned. So why are we rushing? Why aren't we having a conversation with people? And since that letter started going public, I immediately started receiving letters attacking me, calling me homophobic, calling me bigoted, alleging all kinds of things about what I believe by people who have never met me and don't know what I believe. I, okay, let's call a spade a spade. I'm a Christian. And are there Christians who are homophobic? Yes. I'm not one of them. Most Christians are not homophobic. I mean, if you're going to say that, why don't you just say, well, there are Jews, or Muslims, or Sikhs, or other people who are homophobic, so why don't we just say all of them are? And ladies and gentlemen, there are atheists who are homophobic. Does that mean every atheist is homophobic? It's ridiculous when you apply it to other people, isn't it? So let's stop the name calling, and the attacks and intimidation, and let's start dealing with the issues. I am not a doctor, I am not a psychologist, but I looked into this and the data shows that 80%, okay, in the last study in the last year I've heard it's between 75 and 80 now, 75 to 80% of children who self-identify as transgender turn out not to be. Okay, we want safe schools for everybody. We want safe schools for anyone regardless of race, religion, sexual orientation, or gender identity. And that's what we have with the 2004 policy. Now, I believe another parent passed me their time, so I would like to continue with the, with the Sorry. parents' permission. Sorry, you have one more minute. One more minute, okay? Then I can tell you, I attended the DPAC meeting the other night to have a conversation, and what I was told is, well, who do you represent? You don't represent anybody, so fine. Saturday night around 11 o'clock, I think I put a petition out to a few people by email. And in the last 24 hours, they have been filling up petitions and emailing them to me to the point where I can't even print them all yet today by time for this meeting. I couldn't count them, but I can tell you we're in the hundreds, if not thousands of people that are requesting that you slow down this process and get the College of Physicians and Surgeons and the College of Psychologists to approve and endorse any policy before you even consider voting on it. And if they say it's the good policy for everybody, I will agree, but teachers are not qualified to know which people are in the 80% and which people are in the 20%. And if you have a child who's confused, and you know, we're not talking about older teenagers, this policy is so vague, 
it just doesn't set any limits on ages, it, doesn't, it keeps out doctors, it keeps out parents at the request of any age of a child, and that's inappropriate. We need professionals to deal with this situation, not teachers who are biased and have an agenda, or people who have an agenda. This debate is going on in the medical and uh, mental health communities, and if they don't know what's right, then all you are doing is using our children in a social experiment to prove that one side of the debate is correct. And that is completely inappropriate. And I have a lot more to say, but since you won't allow me to speak anymore, because this is such a contrived process. Thank People you for your presentation. Staff to this meeting, speakers have been told you can hand speak. Thank full you for your camp. presentation. Setting and I got a sense that that's what you felt in the last little while here. My question is, what, from your perspective, should be the next steps for the board here? You know, in, in a kind of an organizational sense, rather than carrying on in a in a situation that's basically just throwing out people's points of view. In my view, you should cancel all further public meetings until this goes back to the staff to talk to the professional organizations that should be involved in improving this policy. And it, it, because the, what this is doing is setting up a war. And I can tell you the parents, I, in my petition it says we care for all people regardless of race, religion, sexual orientation, or gender identity. I don't hate those people. I care for those people. And yet rumors are being spread around, which by the way, I have served my PAC for four years, two as chair, and now you have the whole grade 12 class upset because they, they're saying I'm homophobic. How do you think that affects my child? Yeah. Like, bullying? You want to know about bullying? Try being a Christian in this town. Yeah. yeah. Try being a conservative in this town. Yes, bullying happens to everybody. The most two high profile suicides in the last year, Amanda Todd and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Retea Parsons, they got bullied, they committed suicide. Bullying is horrible for anyone, and we care about everyone, including the LGBT community. We do care, and you have to believe that and stop spreading the lies that is creating a war. Thank you. Uh, Tell me what percentage of folks who signed that petition are Vancouver residents? I have separate, started separating them out, and as I said, I literally have at least another 50 to 100 emails before I left at 3 o'clock that I couldn't even open to tell you the numbers. I mean, give me more time and I will, but this timeline is ridiculous. Well, I would be interested in knowing how many are Vancouver parents. <laughs> I have, can tell you I have literally hundreds for sure that I did sort through last night from every school in the district pretty much. I have a question to Secretary Treasure, Treasurer. What kind of business must be conducted in private by the Vancouver School Board in, in accordance with the School Act? Thank you, Chairperson. Um, basically, it's kind of a confidential nature dealing with personnel matters, property matters, uh, uh, confidential strategy to be discussed by the board, that type of thing. And it's my understanding that it it's, goes against our, our oath of office to do otherwise. We have strict guidelines for what's confidential and private and what's public. 
Thank you. So the other question is, do we have any kind of requirement that we have to have authorization from a professional body, such as the College of Physicians, Teacher Regulation Branch, College of Psychiatrists, before we adopt policy uh, as elected officials elected by the citizens of Vancouver? Chairperson, not that I am aware of. Uh, thank you very much for your submission. And I, you did make a reference to being the big pack chair, and there was a, an open letter that um, certainly we received, and you referenced your role as big pack chair. I just, um, I guess, looking for clarity, I, have, I think we've all probably been contacted, and I certainly have as a former big parent, by a number of parents questioning um, whether you were speaking on behalf of the pack, and there was consultation with the parents, or if this is a, a personal view just so we're clear who is speaking for me. As you know, because I copied you on letters that were the, the attack letters that I was defending myself in, I set out the constitution and bylaws of the Bing PAC, and it specifically states that if an issue comes up between PAC meetings that um, is a, requires a decision, that you have to consult a simple majority of the PAC executive for a decision, and once the decision is made, it is then um, the, the official position of the PAC. I can tell you that we had an overwhelming majority of our PAC executive agree to endorse the letter. And let's be clear, the letter only says, slow the process down and have consultation with parents and doctors. It doesn't say, we're homophobic which is what is being told about the letter, I challenge anyone to read that letter and point out where I have said anything homophobic. Thank you. How many, when you say a majority of the PAC executive, how many members are there in the PAC executive? There are 13 and we had 12 and one person simply didn't respond and later said they didn't have time. I think the letter has uh, gotten a lot of publicity, whatever. Could you read it to us? No, it's far too long. <laughs> and uh, there's a shortened one-page version, uh, but I I think it's it's on the PACIS website. That's P-A-C-I-S for protecting all children in school. It's You can find it there. You can find the 2004 policy, and you can find this policy. And I think the 2004 policy is excellent and should remain in place until there's a better policy. And if we need to improve it, absolutely. If we have concerns, absolutely. But as being chair, I talk to parents all the time. I didn't even know this was an issue because the policy is working so well in our school, and that's a good thing. And maybe Bing needs to be a model for other schools where it might not be as good. And let's work on that. Let's work together instead of starting a war against each other, please. Side and, and I don't think that's ever good for having an open conversation. And that's partly why I asked the camera person to step back. I, I think people need to feel free to speak in their minds here and so we can have a conversation here. And, and as a trustee, I am listening. I'm not, you know, it's, uh, so it's our minds are not made up. And I think, you know, I see some signs up there do the best for kids. I think we're all here because we want to do the best for kids. So I just want to start off with that. So. Regarding the consultation, uh, regarding this policy, um, I, I'm also chair of committee four, and we're going through about 30 different policies right now, which some are getting rid of, because they've been around for 30 years, some are adjusting to, um, and, uh, and a lot of these don't go out to the public or they're, they're done in committee meetings. So the question through the staff, just on us moving through a process, changing policy. My understanding is this went through an advisory committee, is going to committee three, which is this committee right now, and then when there is general agreement amongst committee three, it will go to a board meeting, and then at the board meeting there will be a vote of the trustees on whether to, to go forward with the changes uh, to the consultation process. So I guess my question through the staff, and I don't know who the appropriate staff person is, is A, am I correct in that process? B, are we following that process? 
and uh, uh, that's it. Thanks. So through the chair, yes, you're correct in the process. We are following it. Um, practice for a while has been with uh, policies related to the education sector of the organization that we come to committee three through an advisory committee and generally have at least two rounds through committee three, sometimes more, depending on um, the feedback that the committee and particularly the trustees are looking for. Um, and then at some point the trustees decide whether they wish to move a recommendation forward for consideration at a board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, for your presentation. Our next presenter is uh, Committee members. My name is Adrian Smith. I'm a legal campaigner with the Pivot Legal Society. I'm a Vancouver resident and I'm also a trans person. I'm a Christian as well, if that matters. Um, <laughs> with respect to the previous speaker, I would like to disagree with her. This is a 10 year old policy, um, and I applaud the school board for making explicit recognition of trans and gender queer students in the umbrella that LGBT means something and I'm glad that we finally recognized that um, and I'd also like to remind the committee that uh, it's very courageous what you're doing as elected officials having open public debates about matters of public policy and I am delighted to be here as a group of uh, professionals, doctors, lawyers and care providers who have come to tell you about the global and legal best practice in dealing with trans people. So we're here and thank you for hearing us. I have come here to tell you about two things. Um, the first is the uh, recognition of privacy rights of gender, queer, trans, and questioning students in the school uh, system, and this policy is explicit recognition of that. A line in the policy that I understand to be controversial calls for official communiques home to students to be made under their legal name and their pronoun, their legal pronoun, unless they respect a change. I think that this is uh, not controversial. This is what happens with every student in the system. Um, and it's really, really important to protect the safety of trans students who may go home to a family uh, that is not supportive of the position that I am saying here today. When I first came out to my family as a trans person, I was afraid. I tied my dog up outside our house. I had packed a bag of things and I had a safe place to go in case my family reacted badly because every other trans person that I knew who had come out to their families had experienced violence. And I was afraid that this would happen to me. My family was lovely, instantly, and they were very supportive of me in my life. But this might not have been the case, and I would have been exposed to terrible violence if a letter had come home with the wrong pronoun for me against my wishes. Um, and this policy protects privacy rights of students, and, and I commend the Pride Advisory Committee and and this committee for that wording. Um, wearing my pivot hat now, I would like to commend the school board for its support of this policy because recognizing trans students is a legal obligation of the school board. And without uh, repeating the remarks of my colleague, Ms. Finley, too closely, she and I are involved in two British Columbia Human Rights Tribunal complaints against school boards, which are not the Vancouver School Board. And I am glad that this policy will protect Vancouver from that kind of liability. These children are uh, complaining against their school boards for failing to accommodate them as trans children in the school system and referring to them with their proper pronouns. And uh, Vancouver is not exposed to that liability. Um, I also feel like in Vancouver we are in a tremendous place to make a leadership role in the world. Your colleagues on the Parks Board have recently um, become world leaders by acknowledging and welcoming and making physical space for trans people to access Vancouver parks and rec facilities. This is a fantastic thing. Um, Vancouver's uh, policy is uh, 10 years old now. It is well due for revision and this will bring us back into the forefront globally so that you know the school board can live up to its mandate of welcoming them. 
all students and access to a place where you feel safe and comfortable and your legal rights are protected and you're not suffering dire medical consequences or being referred to a series of healthcare professionals uh, which you haven't asked for and don't need uh, is, is part of making education accessible to all students in Vancouver. And I'd like to commend the committee and the board for its bravery in considering this policy and I look forward to your passing it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, Trustee Backus. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I just, um, um, as a legal question, I just, uh, as you're referring your reference to the legal, just around the issue of privacy again, this has come up again and again, and I've had all kinds of interesting mail myself on this issue, um, and trying to provide clarity on that obligation of confidentiality. And I've had people ask me, well, what age or, um, uh, and the issue of sending information home with the gender that the student doesn't identify with in school. And I'm just wondering if you can comment on that from a legal perspective, if there's something that the board should be aware of as we go forward in considering these policy revisions. Every person has a legal responsibility to report if they believe that a child is in danger from a source outside or a danger to themselves. That's the legal responsibility. <coughs> I don't think anything in this policy activates that level of responsibility in the school. And in fact, I think that we have a responsibility to keep trans students safe who may be going home to unsupportive families where they would encounter family violence. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, 
I speak in support of this revised policy and regulation on sexual orientation and gender identities because I know that it will provide all children the resources to respect each other, to be safer, and to build healthier relationships. If I were back in the public school system, these policies would support me in being stronger and starting at an earlier age to hold a difficult space of conversation with my parents about the homophobia and transphobia, the transphobia that they were socialized. Um, I think we're at this historical moment in which school boards and other political bodies in rural colonial states are working towards improving the education of children by addressing homophobia, transphobia, and the oppressions found within our cis heteropatriarchal society. Um, much of these oppressions being warring nations, tools of divide and conquer, and tools of sustaining power and balance and unjust hierarchical administration. I think we have to get to the root and really be more radical to speak to the homophobia and transphobia and also come from a place of understanding that a lot of people of color here um, they have had legacies of colonialism and um, just destruction in which they have to internalize the bullshit that they're taught so um, I will now speak in Cantonese um, um, our city of colors um, so what I just said is that um, there's an organization called Our City of Colors, which I'm not here to represent today. They can get into the history of homophobia and transphobia on this land, and also in many other places in the world. They can provide the educational resources. So thank you for everybody who's showing up here. and. Um, I'm glad that as a racialized person, I'm speaking out in support of this policy. Trustee Valentine and then Trustee Wu. Thank you for your presentation. Um, are you from Vancouver? No, I'm not. <laughs> Uh, so you came to Canada when you were quite young, right? Yes. Uh, so like, because the reason I'm asking is, do you think you need some help in translating what you said in Chinese just now and from what you said in English just now? I see some discrepancy between what you said in Chinese and what you said in English. To be fair, for all the English audience here, I think, do you think we can help you with translating what you said in Chinese into English? I would love to do that myself, thank you. So, I can do it if I'm offered the time. Sure. So because like the reason I was suggesting was what you said in Chinese is quite different from what you your own translation into English. To be fair to all the English speaking people, I would like to translate exactly what you said in Chinese into English so that people know what's going on in the other language. All right. Thank May you. Maybe given the time. Yeah. Is that a go for me to translate? Or do you want to get a school board professional to do that? I think we're here just now, so when people in here, they want to hear what you say in Chinese, because I don't want people to hear exactly what you said in Chinese, because to be fair to everybody, right? And because there's some discrepancy in what you say in Chinese and what you say in English, oh, so... Could we perhaps have that done a little later? So meaning that you guys will be all deprived if the presentation is in Chinese then? Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Sorry, Trustee uh, Valentine. Uh, point of order. Um, this conversation is really primarily for Vancouver parents, and I'm just hoping that the chair will make sure that the people who are speaking are uh, from yes. that. Yes. Can we, uh, can we, can we ask everyone to sign up to indicate that you are uh, from Vancouver, that may be here? An oversight. Thank you for your knowing that. Andrea? Just thank you, Jeff.
Chair, just uh, maybe we can ask this question from Lennon Cronella. I think there was some confusion um, with the registration. We had far more people register than we normally do, and I know a decision was made at some point to try to prioritize the number of speakers, so we can just clarify how the list came in, and I know it was part way through the registration we realized we wouldn't have time to hear from everyone. So I think there's a reason why earlier speakers may not have been asked uh, if they're ready for residents or not. So uh, through the chair, uh, when we started to receive uh, more people waitlisted for this evening and for the 22nd than we had spaces for, we were asked to just to confirm that we were in fact hearing from the board's constituents, Vancouver residents or student or sorry families with students in Vancouver public schools. Uh, so all of those emails started going out about midday yesterday. We continued all the way through till about dinner time tonight to receive requests from people to speak this evening asking us to please confirm by this evening that they could speak. So everyone received back an email uh, indicating that the board would accept written submissions at this point, that both evenings were full on speakers, and then individual emails went back to any uh, one who was already registered to ask that they please confirm their residency. Some people chose to not do that, and some people, I think, just did not have the opportunity to read or respond in time. So we were hoping that people had read that email requesting that it's Vancouver residents. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, if uh, folks would lower their signs up here behind you and beside you can see. Thanks. Hi, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Andrea Sauchuk. I'm a family physician. I currently live and work in Vancouver. Um, I have a number of affiliations, but as several other speakers have said, I'm speaking on behalf of myself this evening. So I'm a family physician with Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, I have four years experience working with gender diverse and trans communities. I'm also a person who identifies as gender non-binary, as in outside of the sex and gender I was assigned at birth. Um, I also volunteer with the Catherine White Woman Wellness Center where we see trans and gender diverse people exclusively. Um, I am a clinical instructor with the University of British Columbia and I'm also a member of the Canadian Professional Association for Transgender Health. I've come today to speak in support of this policy and I would like to thank the school board for putting forward a policy that has been needed for many years and is in no way a new or unprecedented idea. Um, I'd like to highlight a few points, and I think a few people have spoken before me that have focused on some of these, so maybe I'll try to keep it a bit more brief. Um, as I think many of us know, the youth that we're discussing are highly vulnerable. And I think the point that I would most like to make is the societal impact that gender-based violence, transphobia, homophobia, cissexism, and heteronormativity have on our youth. And this is, in fact, all youth. So when we look at the studies that a lot of us are citing, it's not in fact just trans and gender diverse kids that suffer at the hands of gender-based violence. It's a lot of kids who might just not fall out inside those norms that we expect. And so for those of you who are putting yourself on one side or another and are maybe on a side where you don't have the experience of being trans or know any trans people, consider times in your life when you have felt less male or less female than an expectation of society. These youth that we're discussing are highly vulnerable, so a national study in 2010, long after the last PSB policy was in place, showed that nearly 80% of trans kids felt unsafe in their own schools, and when half of them went for help, it was not to be found. So it's very clear that current policy is not doing enough to support our kids. Children are more at risk for depression and isolation, and at this point I would like to speak on the issue of families and confidentiality. As much as we would like to believe that children are going home to safe and loving and caring families, this is not always the case. And so often, much like other issues that might come up during childhood or adolescence, speaking to a safe person in school, a teacher, a mentor, another student, might be that kid's first opportunity to really be themselves and to evade some of that oppression that they may have felt. So the question of confidentiality is in fact of utmost importance here, as it is in other cases, um, aside from, uh, as Adrian mentioned, when the direct safety of the child is in question. I'd also like to speak about gender self-determination. So once again, we are all expected to be in a tiny box that very few of us fit into. And when we're looking at kids who want to express themselves in a gender diverse way at a young age, 
and the statistics that have been cited previously about kids that change their mind or do not actually become transgender, I think it's important to look at those from the perspective of the actual studies. So unfortunately, when we're misrepresenting previous medical evidence, um, the, the perspectives can become a little skewed. So some of the numbers that have been cited are not in fact related to kids that might identify as transgender, but to kids who actually represent gender diversity, meaning a little boy who wants to wear a barrette and identifies as a little boy and yet gets made fun of for his wearing a barrette is quite a lot different than a child who's so dysphoric that they require uh, extra support, requests to use a bathroom of a different uh, gender than was assigned to them, and requiring extra supports at school. So I, I'd just like to um, make a point about those statistics because I think those have been misrepresented. I would furthermore like to point out that if there are kids who are expressing themselves in one way that is not their assigned gender, and then they later go on to express in another way, let's all take a moment and wonder, who cares? <laughs> point I would like to make is around the issue of safe spaces. So as a clinician, I have seen so many people who, as Dr. Townsend stated, have faced years of oppression, isolation, who have literally, like literally, had their gender identity attempted to be beaten out of them. Could everyone just take a moment and think about that? Beaten. So when we think about safe spaces, much of the work I do as a family physician, when I could be prescribing blood pressure pills and all the other uh, intricacies of family practice, I'm actually spending time helping people find safe spaces. So whether this is housing for people who are discriminated in their housing search, whether this is negotiating how to use a bathroom for a gender diverse child or adolescent, these spaces are so, so, so valuable. And so the idea that a child can self-determine gender and be accessible to a bathroom of their choice, can join a sports team of their choice, can have that ability without the net, without any need whatsoever for a medical professional's opinion is of utmost importance. And in this way, we will continue to see healthy communities and we will continue to grow as a city and as a community where we no longer see the long-term effects of the institutionalized violence that we have reported for years. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your presentation and for some of the clarification on statistics. Um, some of the concerns that um, I, I've heard lots of, I've had all kinds of interesting messages and calls and um, discussions, and a question that has come up repeatedly is uh, asking if we have, as trustees and the board have consulted uh, medical professionals on this, on this policy. And, uh, as I've seen it kind of evolve and seen the, the drafts and revisions, I, it, it didn't strike me as a medical kind of document. It struck me as a document on how we support kids and keep them safe in schools. So I'm just curious from your perspective as a medical professional, um, do you see anything in this proposed policy revision that does require uh, specific medical advice as opposed to policymakers in a school system who look to include and make all the students feel safe and, and, and supported? <coughs> Um, I, I'm trying to find the medical question in there myself that people keep asking me to have answered, and I'm not really clear on, on what they're seeing, but I'm wondering if from a medical perspective there's something specific other than the information and advice we've certainly heard about the importance of um, supporting students and some of the risks when they're not supported. But I'm just curious if there's anything in policy that looks of a medical <coughs> nature as opposed to more of what school district policy makers generally deal with, which is about making sure schools are safe and supportive. <coughs> so, um, can you hear me? So, um, I would tend to agree actually. So, I think a number of us felt the impetus um, to come and speak today um, after hearing some of the concerns that there wasn't really a medical basis for this discussion. But I do feel that it is more of a community based and school based discussion. Um, there's no question that gender diverse children exist, and the question is not in this do document about diagnosing children, and I think that's another point that's been mis misrepresented. So nobody is asking teachers or mentors to diagnose anyone. In fact, that's not really something we do much of even in the clinic these days um, with changing practice guidelines. But um, the, the difference, I think, here is that, you know, Rather than creating a barrier towards medical care, I actually think that we're creating safer spaces for those who do need to access medical care because if they find a safe space within their school, then they might be more likely to um, seek help if needed. So no, I don't think the policy needs to have a medical 
representation or medical say so. I'm very pleased to um, speak on behalf of it if it seems helpful to people, um, but I do trust the school board um, uh, to make these decisions in the best interest of the kids. Thank you. <coughs> Any further questions? Just to, sorry, Trustee Valentine. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I'm just kind of concerned about the one of the speaker's comments about feeling consulted, uh, being in a, a parent, um, being the pack, pack chairperson, and not knowing about this. I guess would you not? Would you have any objection for this to go to? I mean, you don't have any concerns that uh, regarding the medical field or the psychiatry field in look overlooking this, would you? I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, we would look, uh, there's some people here. Uh, I'm more con <coughs> concerned about the consultation process here, and I want to make sure that people are listened to. And I feel that this has been kind of rushed. And so I guess my question to you as a medical officer, um, you don't have any concerns about this going to the general medical board or psychiatric board for consideration just to get a sense I mean there's no urgency that we have to slam this thing through like tomorrow or next week is that correct well how do you feel about that well there's I think there's two questions there so is there an urgency here yes I think there is um, I think that the safety of kids has been at risk and continues to be at risk and I think that the more we delay a policy like this the more children will be harmed and continue to be harmed um, Whether or not we should consult uh, a larger body, um, I don't know if it's my place to speak on that, but I would, I mean, ask the board to question how many Vancouver School Board policies are asked to be evaluated by a professional college uh, on the provincial or federal level. Um, I don't know. Thank you. Any further questions, Trustee Wyman? Thanks, and it's great getting some, some more medical advice. Uh, I think it's helpful at times. Um, one of the, you've got inundated with emails, and, and you hear some of the conversation here, and, uh, and, and I have a young son like myself. And, and I guess one of the uh, one of the concerns I'm hearing, and I just like your comment because you're working with, with students that are transgender and trans area. Um, I want, as a physician, how do you distinguish between uh, a girl that's being a tall boy or a boy that likes girly things versus somebody that truly is out of step with their, with their assigned gender and would benefit from uh, from from moving uh, to the gender that they identify themselves with? So I would like to make it clear, I don't work with children, so I work with adolescents and adults. So the youngest kids I would be working with would be about age of 16. Um, I'm not sure the relevance of, of the question. I mean, it's a long discussion about the type of assessments that people have, but certainly there is. I mean, do we have order, please? Could you be respectful of the uh, speaker? So, order, please. So, the, the people, if I could comment, the people I treat have all been children at one point. <laughs> so, um, the question that you raised, I mean, gender is such a diverse and lovely mess of things, um, and so I think that I really look forward to a day when it doesn't really matter, you know, whether someone needs to be diagnosed and, and seek treatment or whether this person would like to, you know, go ahead in their experience and live gender as a tomboy or a young drag queen or gender queer, whoever they want to be, because again, I don't, I don't actually think that that diagnostic um, capacity needs to have a place in this discussion. I think it's been placed into the discussion in a misguided fashion. Um, and if there are kids who do need to see a physician, as some children do, which is a minority of children that I had, um, I, I really trust that the numbers are not going to be so overwhelming that the school board could not face it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and, and there are many health professionals, and I feel very fortunate to work in a community where I, I trust that through the power of Google, um, a school advisor who had the gumption or a teacher who had the gumption could easily connect with some resources in Vancouver to help these children. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, oh, sorry, one, one question. Patty, sorry, uh, Trustee Brackett. This is more of a comment and a question. 
question and thank you. And just for clarity, uh, you know, the, the board wants to consult. It's not just parents. It's not just people in the Vancouver community. We we represent uh, the Vancouver community, and I think this is an important policy discussion that really transcends. Uh, it reflects community values, and so we certainly respect and welcome uh, views of parents, non-parents, professionals, non-professionals. But it is the Vancouver community, and what we do in schools is an important reflection of what we what we do in society. So I just want to be clear that uh, we certainly welcome this, this kind of submission and it is much appreciated. Thank you, Andrew. Tony Kang, or sorry, it's Tony Wang. Sorry. and my son goes to the DLG elementary. Yeah, I'm here to express my support for the petition and position uh, presented, presented by Cheryl Chandley earlier. And uh, I would like to give my allotted time to her if she late, uh, later she wants to speak again. And because uh, primarily she's, uh, her first English is English, uh, sorry, first language is English, and uh, she she can speak in a way that would be better understandable by the community and all the audience. And uh, yeah, I think uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? If not, I'll ask uh, City Hines. space for this conversation. Um, I'm here today in two capacities, as a researcher at Simon Fraser University and also as a parent of a child now in grade six who identifies as gender creative. Since age three, my daughter has been clear and confident about what feels right for her to wear. Clothing sold in what is called the boys section, no pink, no flowers, and what length of hair, short. At age four and a half, she started kindergarten in a VSB school. Almost immediately, she began to be challenged and given a hard time about using the girls' bathroom, repeatedly being asked, are you a boy or a girl, in accusatory tones, and being told she was in the wrong washroom. Bathroom harassment continued in grade one and grade two, and she began to experience bullying and harassment in the classroom and on the playground as well. At recess, she shadowed the playground supervisors. She begged us to come home for lunch for bathroom access and to avoid teasing. She decided that the only way to be safe at school was to grow her hair and wear what she called her disguise. Jeans with pink detailing, a crocheted shawl. A few months later, she decided the disguise was not worth it. She cut her own hair with her craft scissors in her bedroom and went back to her regular clothes. But the fear and anxiety around the bathroom and the playground remained. I could give you a lot more detail and many, many more examples, but in the interests of time, I'll move ahead. We saw clear and very distressing mental and physical health effects. Our daughter stopped wanting to go to school or went with a sense of dread, often feeling sick to her stomach on the way. She avoided the bathroom all day, which meant that she really had to go badly after school. She avoided drinking and ate less in order not to have to use the bathroom. She did not want to participate in after-school activities. We saw a bright and creative child's love of learning plummet. We had numerous meetings with the teacher. We met with the vice principal and the school counselor. Although they were caring, they didn't know what to do beyond assigning a bathroom buddy, which was not enough. On the whole, we felt that the seriousness of gender-based bullying on young children was not understood. In short, the school personnel lacked what the VSB in this policy now has. Clear and specific policies right across the system that allowed children like our daughter to feel safe and participate fully in school. <coughs> During the summer before grade three, our daughter indicated she did not want to go back to school. We moved her to a small independent school which, she has been, which has been safe and inclusive for gender-independent kids and where she has thrived for the past four years. 
Now as we look ahead to high school and a return to a VSB school, we are heartened and encouraged by the policy developed here. The policy provides the systemic guidelines and concrete material suggestions, such as access to gender neutral bath bathrooms and change rooms and reducing sex, seg sex segregated activities that were lacking in our experience and that might have made a huge, huge difference to our child's experience of schooling. In addition to being a parent of a gender non-conforming child, I am also a postdoctoral research fellow in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University. In my work, I study and teach about the health effects of the societal enforcement of rigid binary gender norms. Through this work, I am a co-investigator on a proposed national research study that will explore the medical, social, and family outcomes of transgender children and youth in clinical care. I'm just about done. This study draws on the expertise of a large national team of academic, clinical, service provider, and knowledge user partners who support and encourage educational policies just like these as a positive and important move forward in creating safe and respectful educational environments for all children, and that will increase the health and well-being of trans and gender non-conforming children and youth. On behalf of this research team, and yes, I do have their full support, that includes Dr. Daniel Metzger, Dr. Heather McIntosh, Dr. Margaret Lawson, Dr. Greta Bauer, and many others. On behalf of this research team and my partner and I as parents, I would emphasize that these changes be implemented right away and at the earliest moment in a child's entry into school so that every child feels safe and welcome in every part of every school every day. Assessors, uh, which means I actually do surgical assessments for adults. So I've had the opportunity to see people from ranging in age from uh, quite young uh, up until the age of 71. Uh, I also maintain membership with uh, associations related to transgender health. Uh, I've had a part time private practice in North Vancouver where I provide care to youth with gender issues since 2008. Uh, I had prior training. Uh, in uh, the gender clinic in Toronto uh, under the supervision of Ken Zucker and uh, Susan Bradley. And I've um, tried to be uh, more up to date as time has gone on. I've had the privilege of working with youth from around the province and in doing so I've seen a range of reactions from families, communities, and schools to youth with gender expression that lies outside the usual norms. My focus of practice is for people who are seeking medical care. It's not. Uh, LGBT, uh, the, the whole spectrum. Uh, I see trans kids mostly, although I do see questioning kids as well. Uh, youth with gender dysphoria, or kids who are questioning the gender, face many obstacles when navigating childhood and adolescence. In my practice, I've seen youth experience rejection, bullying, and in some rare but particularly disturbing instances, I've, I have seen them subject to violence, which we've already heard about. I've also had cases where it's been difficult for them to feel uh, safe in school environments. 
Not surprisingly, I've seen many kids become highly anxious and drop out of school. And in some cases, have become literally housebound. With the advent of the internet, more and more kids reach out and connect with others through social media. And this has a lot of bonuses for kids who feel isolated. However, they also share stories that can be quite frightening. And it ends up being, you know, my job to try to help kids feel that they can safely live in the world. Um, however, um, that sometimes can be very difficult for me if I don't really feel confident that there is a safe space for them to go to. Um, I've also seen more subtle types of exclusion. It's important for you to know that as part of my work with youth, and I, I tend to work mostly with teens, I may actually ask them to move forward and challenge themselves by testing the waters. That is to actually live in the gender that they want to be. And this is actually part of you know, their journey. It's something that I want them to do. However, I've also found that it, it can be quite um, anxiety provoking for them, but also me. In fact, sometimes I've seen considerable backlash. Usually, uh, I think that the backlash <coughs> results from confusion on the part of the public, prejudice, or lack of knowledge, at least in my opinion. I've seen many youth successfully take this path in the face of considerable obstacles. While I am amazed at their courage and perseverance, I do not believe that exposure to harassment or discrimination, subtle or overt, should be seen as a necessary test for this journey. In fact, in some instances I've wondered if it was ethical on my part to direct a youth into an unsafe or vulnerable situation. I've actually been encouraged by the growing level of support seen in schools, particularly in the Lower Mainland. And I've been very impressed with the work of this school board and the fact that there's an actual you know, consultant available to support youth. And I really want to applaud the school board for the work that's been happening. I firmly, but I want to make a point, I firmly believe that the actions of not only certain consultants, but teachers and school staff can be extremely powerful and influential in these children's lives, often more than what I can accomplish in the confines of my office. I heard that there was some concern about proposed changes to the policy, and I took the time to read over the policy to, to see for myself. From my reading of it, the emphasis is one of anti-discrimination, safety, and inclusion, both for youth and their families. I am impressed with the thoroughness of the document. It touches on many of the practical issues that these youth face, such as privacy, washroom use, and PE. PE is so often something that is off the table for these kids. I would suggest one small change of terminology. The glossary uses the term intersex. I believe that this is a dated term, and I would suggest at least adding in disorders of sexual development. That's a whole other area, but I think it's, you know, it, it is important because I do see youth with this condition. And in conclusion, I would like to commend the Vancouver School Board for this effort. However, I'm, I'm quite aware that there's a lot of concern in the room, and I don't want to discount that, but I, you know, I, I do want to say that I'm, I'm happy to see that the School Board's taking the time to look at this again. Thank you. Any questions? If not, thank you for your presentation. After the, after the next presentation, we're going to have a 10 minute break. So if we could have Jas Jasmine Ming. Um, I'm Jasmine Meng. Uh, I'm a parent from uh, a Kisnano Center School. Um, I'm here. Uh, I endorse that petition and petition that presented by Cheryl. Um, and I'd like to give my allotted time over to her uh, because that petition presents so many people in five minutes is not enough uh, to cover all parents' review. So, uh, hope you would consider about this and give Cheryl more time to finish her presentation. Um, that, uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. On that last presentation, we'll uh, call for a 10-minute uh, break for the recorders. Thank you. We'll, re we'll resume in 10 minutes. <laughs> of my
by Fulbright in school. Um, I would like to tell the story of my experiences in the Vancouver School Board, um, including my three transfers and eventual dropping out. Um, starting in grade nine, I came out as gender fluid for the first time. Afterwards, I realized that people were staring at me, whispering um, tranny and various things under their breath while I walked by. Um, it eventually got to the point where my locker was vandalized, um, my possessions were stolen, and I have found I have found my phone broken with tranny written on the this general area was found. Um, in grade ten, after transferring um, out of the school I was basically chased out of, I came to Kitsilano Secondary School, where um, my planning teacher um, decided to do a the general curriculum's idea for tra for transgendered and queer education, including a film featuring only cisgendered straight people, um, besides one person who was gender fluid, and then asking the class to point out when the transgender person was on screen, and asking them to define what their existence is. Um, in grade 11, I eventually dropped out uh, due to situations like this, situations where I would go into QSAs um, after speaking, and I would be told that trans issues were not the priority of the general club and the general student body. I would also like to point out that I am a lucky one. I am here speaking, even though I'm nervous, even though I'm really scared because of the situation at around, the situation in this room is not exactly the most um, friendly one, but I would like to say that I indeed am a lucky one. There are people whose stories are much harder than I am. There are people who are currently not with us because they have killed themselves, because they have harmed themselves beyond recognition because of this violence. And I would like to encourage the Board of Trustees to pass this motion, to do the amendments to the um, 2004 policy, because otherwise more lives will be lost, and I don't know who will be accountable for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Trustee Bacchus? Um, I guess probably more of a comment, but I just, I really want to thank you, and I also, um, I'm so sorry for what you went through as a school trustee and as a parent and a citizen. I, um, and I really appreciate and I'm so glad that you're here in more ways than one and that you survived that and that you're here to share your experience with us. And uh, I just uh, feel that we need to commit uh, to people who like you who have come forward that we need to make things different for those coming behind. But again, I am deeply sorry for the experiences that you had and I'm also very grateful that you've come to speak tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. I know it took a great deal of courage to make your presentation to us, and I think it was very heartfelt. I just have one question from your perspective of having experienced life in our schools, and that is, are there any practical, concrete things that you would like to have seen happen at the school level that would have been preventative and or supportive in your situation? I would first like, um, for planning teachers in specific, um, due to the situation I, that I was found in, um, to receive anti-oppression training, to receive training that would make them actually knowledgeable in these affairs before they teach to their students. Along with other teachers, who any of them who are teaching a health class, or any class that, class that deals with the human body, human sexuality in any way, to know what they're talking about in an anti-oppression standpoint. Any further questions? If not, thank you. My name is Esther Chan, and I live in Vancouver. I'm a very concerned parent. I believe this transgender issue requires extensive research and consultation. And there are many side effects of the hormonal blockers, and it will be extremely damaging to a child's physical and emotional health if he or she take hormonal blockers for a long time. And there are many scenarios, and I'm just giving one. What if the child regret of what he or she did? and want to change back to his or her original gender. It will be very traumatic for the child as the development of the sexual organs has already been greatly interfered by the hormonal therapy. 
And I believe we should leave all this to medical professionals. This job policy should not be adopted unless it has been reviewed and approved by the BC College of Family Physicians and the BC College of Psychologists. And we have a whole bunch of very concerned parents outside and also in the next room. And they're extremely frustrated because they cannot understand the English language. And they do need to be consulted. And uh, I would request, you know, actually what we request is just more consultation from the parents. We are not asking more. We are not homophobic. We are not whatever the name calling is. We just need more consultation. And we just want to ask, just give us more time to give us consultation. Let the parents know. And we do request the parents to give them time to consult them and also let them understand in their own language. So we, you know, I know that on May 22nd, there's another consultation or whatever you call that, and we request to have translation, please. Question. There's nothing in this policy related to any medical diagnosis because this is not a policy where staff is engaged in anything like that. This is a, a policy that talks about the safety measures that would be put into place should a family and student approach us with a certain circumstance and wish to um, have those supports in place. There's nothing to do with hormone blockers or medical uh, information. As to the second one, I, I would have to partially defer to the Secretary Treasurer. Um, the policies that I'm aware of where there has been outside um, advice are things like uh, from the ministry where we have to put into place uh, policies to support students uh, who have um, conditions with anaphylaxis or diabetes and then at those times they also give us information through coastal health or provincial health authorities. But that's when a policy is being given to us by outside and uh, the procedures are being put in place as part of the government regulation. Trustee Lombardi. Thank you. My question is to staff also, and that is what kind of translation services can the DSB provide at future meetings where someone want, wants to speak in their first language and have it translated into English for us. Is there any provision for that, and how would that be brought about? Staff. <laughs> Through the chair, um, we do uh, sometimes access some assistance from some of our multicultural workers. We have translated questions that have been submitted to the board in writing. Um, it, it takes a few days for that on occasion. We don't have dedicated translation staff. These are staff that are actually assigned to the district to work with students and their families, but we could have them present. Uh, I would say that because of the number of people we booked for the next meeting, that if we were to, to engage in translation, we would probably be a, at least uh, increasing the time by a third. So the trustees would need to consider that. Any further questions? Uh, Trustee uh, Lombardi is supplementary. So I take it if someone would like that translation, they would have to request it beforehand so we're aware of it, and then we would see if the possibility was there. But keeping in mind, it would still be within the time frame of all speakers, including the translation. I just want to confirm that a request would have to be made to us so we know that we should try to get a translator available. Is that, is that the case? 
excuse me. Sorry. Uh, I think it would be too much uh, trouble for you to provide translator. We could provide a translator ourselves. The parents could provide translator ourselves. Maybe just you know save the Vancouver school box some money. Yeah. You know? Thank you. Yeah. But uh, in regard to the hormonal blockers, oh, and we did sorry. actually. Uh, wait, there's a question. Trustee Dan Mike has a question. Just the question is, what would you consider to be reasonable consultation? You raise the issue. I think the parents should be given time and also um, uh, a, a form a committee with the appropriate medical professional to form a committee and then uh, and also get all the advice from the PEC and also the Thank you. Oh, sorry. Through the chair, make this <laughs> little Okay, I'll just speak loud. Um, no, I don't know. <laughs> through the chair, I do request that if the translation is provided, that it's provided by the staff. Thank you. Trustee Wu? Uh, yes, I think we, uh, the right answer is mentioned that a lot of parents, if they don't speak English, they have the right to speak, they need to speak their own language of their mother tongue they feel comfortable with. But with translation, like in healthcare, we like for fair translation for the for patient's sake, we usually double the time of this translation because we need to give equal amount of time for the person who need to speak what they need to speak and and I don't see amount of time for the translator to provide to be accurate translation and not just summarize, right? So I'm um, just in a mind imaginative translation that I mean, you should be cut short the time in the half because in Korean translation it's all the same time frame. So I'm um, asking about your opinion, like if you need translation, do you need to double the time or you can do translation and mother tongue in the same time frame? Well, what is the most important? You know, parents, cons this is our children, you know? And it's very important for the parent to be consulted. And your parent does have a lot of questions. I think the time should be given to the parent to consult and prolong more consultation period. You know, instead of cutting short and just like giving Cheryl, uh, uh, Cheryl Chang, you know, uh, the parent just give five minutes as a consultation, it doesn't make sense at all. You know, I mean, the parents here, we just know the policy about a month ago, and, and it's, it's just extremely hard to swallow. I mean, why would you? not letting the parents know what's going on. Yeah. Thank you, uh, yeah. Trustee uh, Atkins. Um, Chair, just in terms of process, you know, this um, process has been uh, the same process we follow generally for any policy reviews and updates. And we do have, uh, and going up to this, we have representation through our standing committees. Uh, on all of our standing committees, we have parent representation through the Vancouver District Parent Advisory Council and the chair is, is at the table tonight. Through that, DPAC is recognized by the board, like we, rec we recognize the other stakeholders at this table are representing their various associations and groups, whether it's the Vancouver District Student Council or employee groups as well. Um, that is our, our general procedure, and we have advice coming from an advisory committee, which does include parent representation. This information was presented publicly in April, over a month ago. Uh, generally, it would have come back for committee discussion tonight and then potential deliberation or forwarding to the board, but given the uh, many requests to speak, uh, the board is, of course, welcome that and extended this me meeting this evening and next week. In terms of uh, language, uh, we certainly welcome it. If people have points they want to make, they can have someone write them for them. Uh, and, and submit them either by email or by mail. We are open to written submissions. Um, we also have uh, in no limit people who aren't able to get on the speakers list uh, for next week are certainly welcome to send us written submissions. Um, and we will have continued discussion in June. So that's giving it, you know, we've now into a couple of months. These are not sudden proposals. This is, again, the, the main policy has been in effect for a decade. And these are revisions and updates that have been worked on for actually several years um, by by the Pride Advisory Committee, and we uh, certainly appreciate their, their work on that. Well, so. I appreciate your attention, and, but okay, I thank sorry. you. I, I, I just question why the DPEC and also many PECs are not even aware of that, if that has you know gone through a, a parental consultation. Thank you for your contribution. I would like to recognize Drew Dennis next.
feeling a little warm and parched. <laughs> Hello, my name is Drew Dennis, and uh, I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the LGBTQ Advisory Committee to City Council. And I'm very pleased to share a motion which our committee passed unanimously at a recent meeting. And I'll read the motion for you. That the LGBTQ Advisory Committee fully supports the school board's necessary updates and revised policy for sexual orientation and gender identities. Further, that the LGBTQ Advisory Committee appreciates the school board's proactive leadership on this policy. And further, that the LGBTQ Advisory Committee fully endorses the school board's revisions that will make for a fundamentally more safe and inclusive school community. I want to um, just share a couple of observations in my time here this evening. I'm so happy to see so many people come out who uh, care and concern for, uh, for our children, for our youth, and for our students. I'm a firm believer that it takes a village to raise a child, so it's good to see such a strong village out here in Forest tonight. Um, uh, a couple of observations. Uh, one, there's been a lot of talk about the, uh, the timeline and the process, and, I, and my understanding is that this uh, draft has actually been a review for uh, going on a number of years. In fact, the LGBTQ Advisory Committee got a, a look at it, glance at it about a year ago. Um, so it has been around for quite some time. Uh, as well, there was uh, some challenges by earlier speaker around uh, that this is be turning, becoming a political thing. Uh, in my understanding, when I think about political actions and protests, I think placards and petitions. <laughs> the final observation I'd like to share before I share a couple other comments uh, tonight is that uh, it's also been wonderful to see so many young people out here tonight and to see the young people also speaking in support of this policy and asking for revisions to this policy. So congratulations to all the young people who have the courage to be out here tonight. Um, I also co-chair the, uh, the Park Board's Trans and Gender Variant Inclusion uh, Working Group and I believe one of my colleagues, Kai Scott, will speak a little bit uh, more to the policy and programming work that's been happening at the Park Board level with your colleagues. Tonight though, I'd like to take a moment to speak as someone who is trans. My parents thought they had a little girl on their hands. <laughs> they sent me off when I was four years old. Uh, they sent me off to junior kindergarten, and I came home the very first day, my mother tells me, with artwork, and I had scrawled the name Mike in crayon across the bottom, and Drew was not my given name, nor was Mike. So my mother, a little bit suspicious that perhaps I had stolen artwork from another kid in <laughs> kindergarten, said, uh, who's Mike? And I said, I'm Mike. I wasn't supporting by my parents. I wasn't supported to be Mike at school or by my teachers. Uh, apparently, I started trying to be Mike for about a course of about two years. Uh, to, with no luck, I couldn't find anybody to champion me as Mike or support me as Mike. So at a very young age, uh, what I realized, what I learned, was oh, in order to get by, in order to succeed in life, I have to do this girl thing. That's what's expected of me. So conform the message was conformity. And you know what? I actually did a pretty good job. I fooled a lot of people. I think at times I even fooled myself. I was a straight-A student. I was on the basketball team. I had a lot of friends when I was in school. The reality, though, is it caught up with me. I was a third-year university. I was away from home. I was about to graduate. I had my whole life in front of me. The only problem was I couldn't possibly imagine living that lie another day, and yet there was no... I couldn't, uh, there was no role models at that time. I also couldn't imagine how I could change or what could be different in my life. So, uh, there I was, um, third year in university, uh, months away from graduating. It was a cold, wintry March night. And uh, in the early hours of the morning, after a little bit too much drinking and a lot of despair that had been building and growing within me, I walked to the train tracks that were about four blocks from a house I was renting with my roommates. And I sat down in the middle of that winter night without a coat on, on the tracks, with tears streaming down my face, and I waited for the next train to come. Well, obviously we know the story didn't end there because I'm here tonight, full of life, full of joy, and full of gratitude. The point of my story is that I think this is really a situation that we can avoid. Um, we can all give my parents some slack. It was 1972 when they sent me off to junior kindergarten. It was way before the internet and Google. Um, but today, at this top point in time, the studies, the literature, the knowledge, the lived experiences that we know, gender identities and gender diversity exist. 
I am trans. I don't identify along the binary uh, gender lines. I don't easily fit into categories of men or women or boy or girl. And yet our society is so much set up in this two-gendered system. I applaud the school board for this opportunity to uh, really support our trans and gender variant youth and really all students uh, with where they're at. Thank you very much. Any questions from the committee? If not, thank you. Thank you. Line. Then go to the change room to change. 
and uh, my child has some support. It. Okay. We all agree that teachers is to teach. They may not have enough knowledge to deal with the problem that they still encounter. For LGBT context, we have the adequate training and knowledge to provide proper guidance and support for my child. People have my child is the first gender non-conforming student in his school. Therefore, everything is a new learning process to the school. I have to say, I'm here to say, my child's school has done an amazing job. My child is now a much happier and a confident student. I want to give my wholehearted thanks to the principal who's here today and to the teachers and to the coordinator from the school board and to Vancouver School Board today. And I hopefully by the end of my talk, trustees, please support these policies. Thank you very much. situation. Any advice to us as trustees on things that the school board and schools could be doing to help out the parents, so to give the parents support and to, uh, and, and, you know, to, to deal with, to help parents and students and teachers communicate better together on this issue? Um, my personal parents, uh, experience is the school board has done a wonderful job. I, I was very surprised and shocked to hear, uh, to get that phone call, which I dreaded. And I was not prepared for it. And uh, I was uh, I was afraid that the school going to uh, tell me, going to throw out my child away, right, to different school, or tell me to get my child a, psych a doctor to treat his problems, right? So the school board has done a lot, wonderful job. And uh, they support me already. So I don't know. Uh, um, and then if you pass these proposed policies, will further enhance and help us, the parents. And also, um, the parents have to educate themselves. They have to do a lot of study. Really, 
Um, but first heard that get a confirmation, it was the end of work for me. I was very depressed. But a couple of days later, I come out of that depression. I said, hey, my child is brave enough to face the world. And uh, I should be there to help him. And uh, I should put my personal belief and uh, I should put, put myself away and uh, think my child as a ch my child first. And uh, I think uh, a lot of parents, they need to learn that. They need, they, need, they need to respect the kids the way they are. And then they, they need to abandon their, wish, their wishes and expectations. And then they need to expect the child to become whatever they want to become, as long as they are good people. Thank you. Thank you. on behalf of it, it's obvious that uh, these children need to have informed parents and have access to all kinds of uh, support. I've worked in the school board for 35 years, and a part of my role was being advocate for students such as your, your son. And, uh, and um, I'm very pleased that you spoke so well on, on uh, and it's, I guess the, the key part of it is, is that uh, parents do need to be knowledgeable and they need to be informed and my concern yet comes around again with you know it, you were you had a hunch you know over six years about the gender variation that was happening you, you had time to adjust and you weren't surprised there's a lot of people in this room and this is where I think we need to come to some sort of halfway point the people in this room need to have some time to process what you said and to process um, the whole changes that are coming into this community and I think that takes time and I don't think that this board is um, prudent and, and I guess your story prudent in, in going forward immediately in an urgent fashion that we have to adopt this motion tonight for example as one other speaker has said your story is the true testament to how well the system is working out there the professionals that are in the schools right now are supporting you and the families like you and they're doing an excellent job and one month or two months more is not going to make a big difference in making a situation more safer it's already i believe a very safe environment <laughs> so uh, thank you, thank you uh, but much. i uh can i have a lot to say since you say that Could you just but, uh, very quick? okay yes but you see some of these things cannot wait my child i didn't realize he had the because the dry leaves, it's because he afraid to use washrooms. And it's been going on for nine months. And, uh, and some of the were to his kidney, right? So, and I, I, I have to say, uh, I talked to some of the concerning parents who are opposed to these policies. I understand where they're coming from, but uh, I will tell you what they concern a lot as a result of misinformed and the, mis and the misunderstanding and the uh, uh, unnecessary fears. So you have, you're here have to tell them to better explain it, to better explain, tell them the true story about these genders, trans transgender students. Because this policy will make their own children become transgender. I tried six years to make my child straight I, I couldn't. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, I'm going to leave it like that. <laughs> very well, Trustee <laughs> Backus. <laughs> speaker back but I just um, I, I really want to express appreciation and I think um, what I what I've heard 
tonight and even so far, and I know we have lots more speakers tonight and, and next week, is that it's, it's actually too late for some students. And uh, <laughs> it can't be soon enough. So I, I really find the hearing from people and how it has affected them. We've had speakers earlier, and I've heard from lots. And you know what I'm also aware of is the ones who aren't here anymore to speak. And, um, and, and the appreciation to parents who are there for their kids, I guess is what I'm saying. And, and, and I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that the school board was there in this case. Um, I want to know how we can be there in every single case so there isn't that gap. So these are the things we need to hear. And I would say to my colleague, yes, I think it is a pretty urgent situation when kids' lives are at risk. Thank you. Any questions? If not, I'd like to ask Morgan to do her presentation. And just to remind people again that we're on number 20 delegation and we have 36 on the list. Thank you. Members of the board, um, and everybody is here with a sign and with no sign. Thank you for participating in this really important discussion. My name is Morgan Auger. I'm a transgender parent of two children of school age in Vancouver. I'm an alumni of Eric Hammer Secondary. My sister went to Lord Bing and Emily Carr Primary, and she's a teacher in Vancouver. Because I'm transgender, it's come up in her teachings during the Day of Silence. The fact that she has knowledge about transgender issues has caused one of her students to come to her and ask for help about a sibling because they didn't know where to go, didn't know what to ask. And this is really what this policy is about. To try to give guidance and clarity and consistency and the tools for the staff and for the administrators so they know what to do. I'm also the secretary, the secretary of the Transgender Alliance of British Columbia. And as part of my role in that organization, I deal with the consequences of people in your position not doing what we're asking you to do and not, protect, not protecting transgender children. You can see many, many, many different flavors of that. One flavor is like myself. I succeeded, but I kept my status as a transgender person extremely secret. There was no role model, nowhere to turn. Uh, I couldn't share with a teacher. I learned certain negative behaviors like that. So for example, my first ever discussion with a teacher ever was in third year university. That's the first time I met a teacher of my own free will. Part of that was because just I was uh, essentially derailed in the learning process. I still made it through engineering school, but that might have to do with the fact that I have some professors for parents. <laughs> so, I also have a petition. Um, in hearing that uh, your committee is uh, reviewing this and getting some feedback, and that there was some strong negative feedback, I decided that as a transgender parent, and therefore a parent in the LGBTQ community, I would reach out to other transgender and LGBTQ, LGBTQ community parents and see if we could actually bring you support. And so I'm bringing you a letter of support that was signed by 267 people. Approximately 250 of those live in Vancouver, in the city of Vancouver. So this is what I wrote. In Vancouver, the school board and parks board, because we had the parks board before this, are now considering new policies and guidelines to update and align the existing ones with current legislation and practices. These our draft recommendations for the Vancouver School Board, and I gave a link to those. And this is the draft revised policy and regulation for LGBTQ plus students, and there's a link to that. As both policies will be considered in the next few weeks, a small yet loud conservative group may fight it. That's why all LGBTQ supporters must rally. Please sign this petition to show your support to the City of Vancouver's efforts to ensure equal access inclusion and safety for all LGBTQ families in Vancouver. And then the letter itself to Gregor Robertson, Mayor, Parks Board Commissioners, Jenny Hill, Community Engagement Coordinator, and Patty Backus, Chairperson of Vancouver Board of Education. Please support Vancouver's draft policies that aim to ensure equal access, inclusion, and safety for the LGBTQ families. Sincerely, your name. 
Um, this is an online petition, so I have an audit of where the people are. Um, now they are their claimed uh, address, and I can bring this material forward if you need. So, I would like to give an example of where things are right now today in primary schools in Vancouver. Every year, I have to do Trans 101. That's when I have to go to the parents, and the teachers, and the administrators, and the schoolyard help. And I have to explain to them that I'm a transgender parent. And because I'm a transgender parent, my children have a pretty broad view of gender identity and gender uh, norms. And they may not actually fit the stereotypes. I also have to explain to them that because their parent is a transgender woman, they might be particularly sensitive to certain kind of bullying. And therefore, might, that might be more harmful than other kind of bullying that, that they haven't foreseen. Inevitably, the, my younger son, who gets called a girl because he has longer hair, he gets teased by the older kids, he gets into a fight, calls them names, gets into the principal's office. The poor principal's office staff doesn't really get it, even though they're really trying to, and he gets in trouble. And then he comes back to me, he says he got in trouble for being called a girl. This is the stuff that your policy would avoid. You know, we're always worrying about our transgender kids today, but over time, transgender kids turn into transgender parents with kids. And that really complicates things. So we're not really talking about protecting, you know, um, innocent children from other innocent children. We're talking about protecting families and so forth. That's thank you. Thank you. Any, questions? Any questions? If not, thank you, Ami, for your presentation. Ashley. Ashley Lee? Or Lee, sorry. My name is Ashley, and I'm living in Vancouver. I'm speaking on behalf of my own. I would like to present this very briefly. I choose to immigrate to Canada because of its democratic government and cultural diversity. <coughs> I want to see the operation of the Vancouver School Board and the Vancouver Public Schools and all the process for making policies be transparent and in the best interest of all children in the school system. I endorse the petition and would like to give my allotted time over to Cheryl Chang, primarily because the petition represents so many parents and five minutes is not enough to cover all the parents. I sincerely invite everyone sitting in the room to go to the website www.pasic.ca to understand what the petition is about. I have said all I need to say. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Lorraine Graves? Is Lorraine here? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I brought a document for reference. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to submit it earlier. May I pass it up to the trustee? But I will start by introducing myself. Hello, I'm Lorraine Greaves. Uh, I work at Vancouver Coastal Health, and I'm here today representing Vancouver Coastal Health. In being here today, I have the blessing of our Chief Medical Health Officer, Dr. Patty Daly, um, our Medical Director for our Trans Specialty Care Clinics, Dr. David Hall, as well as uh, the Medical Lead for our Transgender Health Information Program, Dr. Gail Knudsen. I'm here specifically today to talk about um, our Transgender Health Information Program, and that's the program I'm representing. I also do have a pretty broad portfolio of youth services at BCH, but I want to mention that we make sure all our youth services at Coastal Health are gender affirming, and uh, policies such as the one before you today are enacted in most of our health services. And when they're not enacted, uh, we endeavor to educate people to adopt those policies. Um, as a manager at Coastal Health, I oversee our provincial, so a BC-wide, transgender health information program. This program is a referral, resource, and support hub for anybody with a transgender health-related question. 
and we get lots of questions. I'm also a registered clinical counselor, counselor with a master's degree in counseling psychology. I have over 15 years of experience working with youth and families, and I'm a parent of a 24-year-old daughter. I currently have a small, time, a small part-time clinical practice working with transgender and gender diverse people at a not-for-profit community clinic. I'm going to refer to trans as an umbrella term today as I'm talking, and so this refers to people whose gender identity and or gender expression differs from what they were assigned at birth. Some trans people may choose to medically transition by taking hormones and having surgery, but that's not the majority. It's estimated that 0.2% of our population chooses to medically transition. 1% of our population in BC is estimated to identify as transgender, gender creative, gender diverse in some way. Um, so at our program, we see gender on a spectrum, and we support gender fluidity and people's right to self-identify. We find that our clients reflect this and our work with them. On the handout that I've provided to you, there's a pie chart at the back. And I'll get you to flip there. You can see that on one of the slides, we work with a group of young people and ask them to self-identify their gender out of 35 youth. There are 16 different gender descriptions. In our work with all young people, we're seeing great diversity in how young people self-identify. So we need to catch up with them as service providers. At our program, we provide tailored information. We provide support to families, individuals, and service providers about gender identity and gender transition. And our program exists because there's a huge need for capacity building, education, and system navigation for stakeholders and people who are going through a gender journey of some kind. We found that there's a huge gap in awareness and, and a real lack of understanding about the experience and needs of transgender youth and adults. We've also seen more children and parents coming forward with lots of questions about what to do about a young person expressing a gender identity that doesn't fit with the one assigned at birth. So we're having to catch up with that work too. Uh, we often get phone calls from youth and families and children uh, coming along with their families who are needing help with schools and other settings so that they can continue to attend school in a way that's positive for them they can continue to be learners. The Vancouver School Board, and I, I work in a provincial context here, has been an absolute leader in supporting gender diverse students. And in fact, the policy that you are adopting, I hope, today or soon, is really just catching up your paperwork with your practice, because we work alongside staff in the schools all the time, doing the work that you see before you. My one recommendation would be to strengthen language around family inclusion and family engagement, uh, because almost always families are involved uh, when possible, but at other times, families are really struggling to get on board with what's going on with their young person's gender identity. And unfortunately, we see, we see family rejection happen, young people fleeing their homes, and then great risks and health harms as a result of that. Uh, there's more in my document than what I can cover here. Uh, but in summary, I've provided you a list of many other BC government and local agencies that are government funded who are making policy revisions and changes to create safer spaces for gender diverse people. There's a list of them there. There's many things happening right now and I think the BSB is just staying in step with what's going on. Um, I am speaking on behalf of myself and Dr. Gail Knudsen and in summary we want to applaud the school board's proposed policy and um, we see it as a vital bridge with these important other policy and human rights advances for transgender and gender diverse people. We want to thank you for being absolutely thorough in your efforts to ensure that all students have the right to a safe educational space. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Trustee Bacchus and then Trustee Lombardi. Thank you very much. And this uh, presentation is really addressing a key question that has been coming up a lot for trustees and the questions we have is have you consulted with the medical community? And while we didn't necessarily think what we were doing in policy was medical in its nature as opposed to supporting students, uh, it's really helpful to have this. So I just want to be clear, this is the official support of Vancouver Coastal Health and the medical health officers in moving forward with this policy. Yes, I do understand that the Chief Medical Health Officer will be making approach to the board herself, and I'm not here necessarily to speak on behalf of her, but I do have her endorsement in saying that I'm here with her blessing as well as with our CEO's blessing. Both are aware that I'm here and speaking on, it on behalf of the health authority. I also forgot to mention that my program staff helped advise to this policy and has worked on it for many years. Yes. Lombardi? Okay. 
Any further questions? Thanks, Lauren, for your presentation. May I make one other comment? Um, I, I've had a learning through this process that it can be very advisable um, for the school board to work with our medical health officers, and I think you'll see an invitation uh, when you are adopting policies that may need a lot of public consultation to work alongside them to have their backing before we get to this point. And so I think you'll be hearing from them soon. Thanks for your suggestion. <laughs> Thank you for giving me this time to speak, to express myself. Um, I feel more comfortable in um, speaking in my mother tongue in the public. So I would like to invite, um, my mother tongue is Cantonese. So I would like to invite um, Trustee Sophia Wu to do the translation for me. I, I think actually if there was someone else, she's uh, Could you get someone? Can I just not one, one, just one moment, please? <coughs> okay. I'll ask the uh, superintendent to make a comment. Through the chair, I uh, would recommend that it would be inadvisable uh, to uh, accept uh, an external uh, translation uh, over and above our official translation services. I suggest uh, the uh, speaker uh, can carry on in the language she is using English. Thank you. Are you able to provide your information uh, so we can translate it? My information, I would like to have it. Your submission? No. Trustee Wu? Uh, just want to ask a question. In healthcare, we are required by law to provide translation. I'm just asking when you school, but are we required to provide translation? Could you call on <coughs> Secretary Treasurer to comment? Chairperson, no, we're not. Uh, we're Are you able to present in English? I can, but it would be difficult for me. I'll try. Okay, thank okay. you. We do appreciate that. Okay, I'm here to speak on behalf of the School Board Watch, which started to work in January 2012. And we have about 300, 300 people uh, participate in our activity. I would like to um, let you know that I have a heart for the gen transgender people, the children, and I also want everybody in the school to feel safe and feel accepted. However, when I look at the, the policy, I fear that it's not about safety or acceptance. I worry when I look at it, it would be very difficult to implement I'll give you one reason, or maybe I can find more. Number one, I feel that this policy is to regulate feelings, expression, in attitude instead of regulating the behavior. I'll give you an example. On the policy statement, it says to define appropriate expectation language of behavior and action in order to prevent discrimination and harassment. So I would like to know like, exactly what expectation do you expect a child. It's not clear. But number two, it would ensure homophobic and transphobic complaints are taken seriously and dealt with expediously and effectively through consistent and applied policy and, policy and procedure. So when I look at the glossary, what homophobia, uh, homophobia means, or what transphobia means, it means the expression of fear. Fear is an emotion, and it's not healthy to suppress a child's emotion, and we should 
allow the child to express their emotion. And we should not punish them or discipline them because of their emotion. So it's very hard for a child to understand when and where they will, they will, will violate this regulation. So I would suggest that the harassment, um, the policy that is already um, exist, the anti-bullying policy is a lot easier to implement than this very vague and abstract way. I am afraid that if this passed, some student uh, will be punished. We don't know. How do you measure? How do you measure? Or how do you investigate a complaint when a child's attitude is not right? Or when a child's expression or the feeling is not right? And it's very hard to investigate. And also, how, um, how can a child um, defend himself or herself when she was wrongly complained? So this is very difficult. So this is my concern. And also, you do not measure a person's attitude. And another thing I want to bring out is I'm the first one who found this on the website about a month ago, accidentally. Very accidentally, I found it. So how come parents did not get notice, did, did not get notified? So I, I'm wondering. And also, when I read um, the cover page, it says uh, the policy, the pur purpose of the revision is to update and align the existing policy and regulation with current legislation and practices. This policy was um, published in April the 10th, 2014. And at that time, I checked the federal government legislation and also the provincial one. There's no such uh, legislation that this document is aligned to. And I understand the provincial law has passed. A bill, Bill 17, has passed. But it's way after this has come up. Okay, so any questions for me? about an issue than I have on this one. So um, we deal with a lot of issues at this board table, and I would say, uh, given the number of speakers and number of emails, it seems to be pretty well out there that this is under discussion compared to any other topic. We sat in here just a few weeks ago dealing with incredibly difficult budget issues um, that really affect services to kids in classrooms and have, have never had Can I a lot of No, I'm making a comment right now. Uh, so I'm just saying, from my experience sitting at this board table in my sixth year now, I've never heard uh, the level of response. So I, I just would question that parents weren't aware this is happening because I've never heard from so many parents. Um, my question to staff is, and it's probably over to the social responsibility staff who are here, um, who can determine who best to speak to. There's been a lot of questions about implementation. How do we implement? My understanding is really what is in these proposals, the revisions, are, are in alignment with current practice. So I think a lot of the practical application questions are probably already being dealt with because we're already doing a lot of what this policy is now clarifying. So I'm wondering if someone could just comment a bit on how we deal with things like the uh, homophobic or transphobic bullying, or particularly how we deal, and it's come up again and again in my discussions with washrooms, uh, change rooms, how do we accommodate and support students in a way that is respectful? And uh, I know a lot of really good work has already been done, so we're not reinventing the wheel tonight, but it would be helpful just to understand uh, how this policy looks in schools or the policy revisions that I know are already consistent with practice. Uh, it's Lisa Pedrini, Manager of Social Responsibility and Diversity. And I, I think the way to best respond to uh, your question about how do we respond is we do what we do best, and that's educate. Uh, when those issues arise, uh, issues where uh, there appears to be discrimination, name calling, and those kinds of things, 
our anti-homophobia and diversity mentor or other staff go into the classroom and work with all the children to understand the value of diversity, to uh, reflect on the fact that for the last 10 years we've had uh, social responsibility performance standards which state that valuing diversity and defending human rights is an important aspect of education. Those performance standards were introduced alongside performance standards in reading, writing, and numeracy, which shows how important that is as part of our education system. And the process of education is, is not one of punishment or exclusion. It's a process of helping everyone understand how we get along together in our diverse society. I believe firmly that the strongest job we do in education is to help people live in our society peacefully and together so that we can have events where we listen to each other as we are tonight with the best interests of our children in our hearts and our minds. Thank you. Trustee DeMike. Now, you mentioned the, um, the lack of, of, of uh, federal legislation on the matter. Where, where is where did you uh, search that out, or did you ask uh, one of the senators? 